the pleasure of introducing Stephen Hines uh, from Google, who'll be talking to us about Android Render Script. Thanks. Okay, so uh, I think this is the first real public talk about uh, Android Render Script, which just uh, which shipped as part of Honeycomb, but uh, just last Tuesday, everything was open sourced uh, to Android open source project. So all this code is freely available now. Um, everything that we everything that we've done is is up there, including a nice copy of the LVM and Clang trees, uh, based on what what we've branched off of and uh, and started working with. So, but I want to focus on I want to give everybody kind of an introduction to the language today and uh, a little bit about you know, kind of the design goals and, and, and what we've done, and then take a bit more of a focus on what the compiler side has done, and stay a little bit away from the graphics side, which is uh, one of the other primary goals of this, but probably not as appropriate for the audience. Um, so there's, a, there's an outline here, but I, I, you know, just to kind of go along with the slides for when people want to look through this again later. Um, so let me talk to you a little bit about the goals. Uh, that, that were set out for RenderScript. Android was looking to do something new for 3D graphics. Um, OpenGL is kind of showing its age, and I know that a lot of people like to look at you know, OpenGL ES and think that you can avoid some of the mistakes that were made. Um, the, the people who, who initially started RenderScript didn't believe that, that OpenGL was uh, necessarily the path forward for 3D graphics uh, in Android. And so in order to achieve the goals that they wanted, which was you know, a nice 60 frames per second, uh, you know, sm butter smooth interface uh, for graphics, they set out to do their own language, uh, and that's where RenderScript sort of started with. Um, it needed to work well with Dalvik, right? So this is, you know, it was important that the Java bindings be, you know, perfectly clean and easy to use. Had to work with all the existing hardware that we were supporting at the time, and had to scale to future hardware. Uh, so this meant that things like GPU compute needed to be somewhere on the roadmap, uh, and not just an afterthought. Um, they needed to be portable across a wide variety of devices. We already had shipping ARM parts. Uh, x86 obviously shipped as part of Google TV and now has tablets and all sorts of other stuff lined up. Um, MIPS as well. Uh, SSE, Neon, GPUs, DSPs. Everybody wants to sort of get in on accelerating uh, applications on Android. And, uh, so portability was going to be you know, design goal number one. Um, and ultimately, like, they wanted to build the 3D graphics and compute API that they wanted, right? And so I started, I started this project after, this, uh, after it had already like, gotten a little bit off the ground, uh, but it helped to work on a lot of the compiler work uh, towards, uh, for the past year, um, including all the work for Honeycomb. So the goals for RenderScript, number one was portability. Um, they needed to be able to take advantage of new stuff without having to cause a recompile from market, because App vendors you know, may show up one day and then disappear the next, and you don't want those applications to just stop working on new hardware just because you know, someone doesn't maintain it. Um, performance was another important goal. We needed to be able to handle advanced vector operations and, and be able to utilize non-CPU processing technology um, where sort of the Dalvik VM was not going to be able to keep up. And we wanted it to be something that was usable. So Android sort of set out initially to be you know, an easy to use uh, programming environment. Uh, and that's why you know, the, the language is the way it is. Uh, so for RenderScript, you know, keeping in mind that we wanted to be portable and high performance, we wanted to make it as usable as we possibly could. So portability, uh, I know a lot of people are probably going to attend the LVM portability, birds of a feather that, uh, that we're doing later. Uh, portability. Uh, in the, for the case of RenderScript was going to be handled by using LLVMIR. So we settled on a version of LLVMIR that we considered uh, portable enough for our needs. Um, so it's, a, it's basically an ARM-based uh, target that we're using. And then all of the backends have to do any additional operations to sort of munge that at uh, you know, basically JIT time. Uh, if they if they actually do need to do anything additional, and both MIPS and Intel have been able to to achieve this, uh, so we're able to run on on, on multiple different devices. Uh, in the same way, a lot of GPU vendors uh, were also looking at LVM as their IR for their GPU devices, and so it made sense to use something like LVM IR because they would already have a compiler backend that was mostly there uh, when it came time to actually exploit GPUs on mobile. Um, 
we use uh, a Clang-based tool. We basically layer our own front end on top of Clang um, that uh, basically compiles a C99-like language with a few extensions. Uh, and we have a few other restrictions as well for things that don't sort of make sense since we're not compiling as you know, like your main function. Um, and this is all done as part of the Android SDK. So this stuff has been shipping since Honeycomb, uh, although, again, the source is available now. So um, now the challenges are that LLVM Bitcode is not 100% portable. So we had to you know, sort of make the restrictions for our own stuff. So it is little endian. The alignments match the size of the types, so 8 by line doubles, things like that. Uh, and then one crazy thing, which sort of caused a little bit of havoc when someone tried to use the clang that we had checked in, um, size of long is pinned to eight uh, so that it matches Java, because we have a lot of Java developers. And when they initially tried to use this and they wanted a 64-bit type, they used long and got a 32-bit type from clang, because 32-bit, uh, or longs are 32-bit on ARM. So we, uh, we move that, we bump that up. So um, performance was the second goal that we wanted to look at. Uh, we considered C99 the friendliest of options, which probably tells you how, how we feel. Um, <laughs> we probably could have picked, picked uh, some other languages, but this seemed to be the most appropriate for, for a high performance language that, um, that the developers that Android typically has could, could actually use. Um, the extensions that we, one of the extensions that we added to uh, C99 was to basically have some uh, primitive built in to do a for each, which is basically the way you would do a kernel launch or a grid launch. Uh, for GPU compute, but this is all done even for CPU side as well. So this is our way of sort of getting that you know nice thread level parallelism. Uh, the memory model is already uh, designed to handle multiple memory spaces, but mostly between um, essentially the control side, which is the Dalvik side, and the script side. And then under under the script side, there can be all sorts of other graphics memory and and whatnot. Um, there's explicit sync points between the memory spaces. Um, and really, the user is only generally going to be manipulating the script space. Everything else is sort of hidden behind the, the driver model. The runtime is asynchronous, and we have uh, two FIFOs to handle all the communication back and forth. So this allows us to actually do some pretty clever stuff to uh, basically separate out when we want to test render script. We can actually run it on different things other than the device. So we can actually execute the render script code on a desktop if we really wanted to um, and keep the Dalvik code running on a, you know, an ARM core. Um, and then the runtime is explicitly designed to not allow the, the developer to see which processor a given script is running on. So this is made to sort of prevent people from saying, well, this time my stuff really should be running on a GPU because it's highly parallel, but then maybe some you know, many core CPU architecture comes along where it would be more appropriate to run on that, and now all of a sudden their application you know, is running slowly because it's running on this highly contended GPU when it could be running on uh, you know, probably like four or eight cores. Um, so as far as uh, usability, um, you know, again, we have these other design constraints for portability and performance. Uh, we completely left out things like local memory and, and thread launch type. Uh, we don't expose these things because they tend to be hard for people to use and optimize for. Uh, generally, when people are doing that kind of stuff, they're tuning for a particular generation's you know, version of an architecture. And those things tend to not they, they, it tends to bit rot really, really fast and end up uh, causing performance problems down the road. So we hide those things and it, leave that kind of uh, optimization to the actual driver model. So um, we, and, and again, like I said, we don't allow them to, to control which processors their app runs on. Um, the feature set is CPU-like, so we're like fully IEEE compliant, mostly because the base implementation is based on running on an ARM CPU. Uh, although we also did a lot of uh, initial testing on x86 CPU. Um, we allow recursion, function pointers, uh, all these fun things that mobile GPUs tend to not like. Um, but uh, we think that this is important for the future. Uh, and it's important not to sort of make the GPU a second class citizen uh, and actually consider you know, a first class compute uh, component. So, there are three things that generally make up uh, all of RenderScript. So we have an offline compiler, and this is the thing that actually converts our RenderScript source language into a portable bitcode file, and then as well as a reflected Java file. So, uh, well, actually one to many reflected Java files. Um, <clears throat> there's an online JIT compiler, and this is our libbcc, and this is the thing that actually runs on the device and does the conversion from bitcode to machine code. 
Um, and this is, again, the part that most partners will be, you know, sort of um, pr pr providing their own version of to target different CPU and GPU combinations, or DSPs for that matter. Uh, there's also runtime library support, uh, and this is where all the script management sort of takes place and where the communication from the, the Dalvik side uh, comes from. We also provide a lot of uh, support libraries, like mostly graphics drawing functions, uh, most of which today are implemented uh, using uh, GLES, but there's no dependence on GLES for the future. So the offline compiler, uh, which we call LVM RSCC, um, although it's under the directory slang in the source code if you go looking for this. Uh, we basically leverage the Clang, or leverage Clang's AST to reflect information and functionality back to Java. So we're basically providing some Java wrappers and metadata uh, back to our control side. Um, and we do this with Clang. It's, it's actually amazingly easy to do. There's really not a lot of code, uh, and I'll talk a bit about how different we really are from Clang. Um, we also do a lot of machine-independent optimizations on the host, mostly because we know that once we get to the device, we really just want to code gen this thing and be done with it. Um, your phone generally is not going to be powerful enough to run a dash 03 compile, uh, you, know, um, you know, when you want to actually use it. Uh, all the bit code uh, goes into an APK, which is the standard Android container for, for apps. So the, the flow for this is generally just a single file pumps through the through the compiler, and then uh, we end up with one bit code file per source file, as well as uh, one to many classes. And so the, the classes actually come, the, the Java classes actually come from, you end up with one script class, essentially, that uh, contains all the, the hooks to get to the bit code. And then the other Java files actually have to deal with if you create additional structs, we reflect back any C defined structures that you have so that you can actually construct versions of those in Java as well to pass along. So those have to be in separate Java files. So there's a whole bunch of things potentially available, but most, most scripts that are simple tend to just have one to two uh, Java files. So the online compiler uh, is obviously based on LLVM. Uh, and right now, the, the version that we have shipping uh, supports ARM and x86. Um, we do know of work to do GPU DSP versions of, of this stuff. Um, <clears throat> so. Right now, uh, we, we do some dynamic linking against runtime library functions, and uh, we're using MC code gen. So in the past, in Honeycomb, we were actually using the legacy JIT path, and we've since moved to MC code gen to generate a .o. So we actually have, I don't know if anybody who went to the linker birds of a feather in the last, uh, last session basically would have, would have um, heard that you know, Shiwei had done this very, very quick 6,000 line linker. Uh, to support this, right? And it's very, very, very bare bones. Um, so we're also looking to, to improve that. Um, and then we also have some helper library here that actually has a bit code translator because we have multiple versions that we support, as well as a metadata extraction tool, which is basically because we, we supply additional metadata to, uh, to the runtime uh, in order to, to actually provide access to these things. And we don't want all of the partners to have to implement this same functionality. So in, in this uh, workflow, um, generally the bitcode files go through libbcc and the librs loader, which is the very, very small linker that we have. Um, and then they're run on, um, you know, the first target for this actually was Zoom, so it was a two-core chip. Um, and we do, like I said, link against several uh, system library bitcode files, um, and we interface nicely with the uh, Dalvik JIT stuff. So, uh, and that's the way that, that this sort of works today. <coughs> The, the runtime is actually the management layer, and we don't support dynamic allocation within the scripts themselves uh, today, although that's kind of a, a nice future goal. So any of the allocations have to be taken care of by the, by the actual runtime layer, and then the runtime layer is able to bind those allocations then in for the, for the script side to actually work with. This also has uh, the additional libraries that I was talking about. So, let me talk a little bit about the Java reflection that we're doing. So whenever we see an externally available, like global variable, or an extern uh, function within, basically non-static functions uh, within the, uh, source the source file, we have to reflect back certain uh, access functions. So we have functions to set and get global variables. Um, we don't reflect setters for const things and, and stuff like that. 
Um, and we, um, we do this all automatically. Uh, we also have ways to access pointers. So pointers basically allow us to bind allocations uh, from, the, from the dynamic side. And this basically, uh, and then in addition to that, we also have uh, function reflection. So we, ha we provide uh, functions to invoke any of the script side functions directly. So this would all be single threaded, very easy to, to use kind of stuff. Um, and this actually does support parameter passing. So the functions don't have to be void functions or whatever, but it is asynchronous, so they're not allowed to return a value. So return values on, on extern functions are, are not possible. Although you are free to use whatever you want um, that are you know, for static functions within, within a script. Uh, the real benefit to, to render script actually and the, and the thing where we're seeing you know, performance gains even on CPUs for multi-core is in for each, which basically allows us to do a parallel launch so scripts are allowed to define one root function, which is basically the equivalent of main um, or basically a, you know, a kernel for OpenCL or CUDA. And this root function is allowed to have you know, a, a particular variety of signatures, but basically it's allowed to stream inputs and outputs, um, supply some user data, and then eventually the, the, the script side version gets XY coordinates basically to know where it is uh, operating on stuff. And then for each, uh, essentially, is kicked off uh, from the runtime, and each instance of this is given a single cell to operate on. So maybe an x and a y, you know, coordinate, um, or a particular x y coordinate value, and it can be done in any order uh, arbitrarily. Uh, for this reason, we always have to have at least one input or output allocation. So allocations have a size statically specified for them, um, and this is what determines the launch dimensionality. And so we can do some optimizations also to make sure that we don't have a lot of overhead in actually doing a lot of threat, like small thread launches. Um, and then in Ice Cream Sandwich, we actually improved a lot of the, the type and dimensionality verification in the Java side. So uh, although we have these root functions, uh, and then this is the, this for each root is basically the Java reflected version of, of that um, <clears throat> for the helper. We actually allow people to call for each within a script. So scripts can actually kick off parallel other scripts. Um, so, and then this is the basically the signatures for the for this for the C99 uh, script side version of for each, which is called RS for each. Um, this is mostly here just for people who want to look at it later. Um, so let me go through a quick example. Like I said, uh, it, this will be a really really fast uh, C99 example of something that you might want to do. So image processing is obviously something that's very, very uh, you know, easy to parallelize because you're just operating on you know, pixels at a time. You can do all the calculations independently and ultimately you know, come up with some result image that, uh, that you know, satisfies what you wanted to do. So in this uh, particular case, we just want to convert something to grayscale, which is actually a really, really trivial thing to, to do. And, and this is available in the samples. So we have one uh, source file which just, uh, we use a bunch of pragmas to basically declare the version so that we know that, that we're compiling the right thing, um, where we know what, what features to be using. Uh, and this just has one single root function that has an input and output uh, uchar4, which is basically a, a four vector of, of pixels for RGB, and then really the fourth one is kind of ignored in this case. And we get an X and a Y coordinate, although we're actually not gonna use it. Um, you can leave those off, but in the example that we shipped, we left them in there for some reason, so. I left it in this example so no one was confused. Um, so we're able to convert that, that uchar4 back to, a, uh, in this case, a float4, because then we want to do a dot product. And then once we're done with that, we actually just write it back out to the output parameter. So there's, there's a v in, there's a v out. Um, and then dot is, a, is a, one of the system library uh, functions from RenderScript. And then uh, these can functions to basically pack colors and unpack colors uh, are pretty common for graphics operations. Um, and so this is obviously just working on just a single pixel. And this uh, ultimately reflects out to this kind of Java file. So, so the Java file is actually a script C, uh, and, and then we you know, suffix it with the name of the original uh, script. And we reflect, obviously, this uh, for each root function, where we do some type checking. Uh, to make sure that we're compatible with, with passing the arguments that the, that the user had in their scripts file, followed by some dimensionality verification, which is also, like again, all auto-generated, um, to make sure that if you have an input and an output uh, stream, 
then you, you, know, you don't have a mismatch in terms of what work has to be done and that you're expecting. And then finally, it actually calls the for each in the driver, uh, the driver API for the render script. Um, <clears throat> so the way that then someone would use this in Dalvik is that they would actually just declare a couple of allocations where they create something from a bitmap. And these are all functions that we provide. Uh, we provide most of the common things that, that people want to do in the Java API that we have. And you, it's easy to, to produce a bitmap, read in, you know, read in these values, and then actually run the script. And you just have to call the for each. And this is basically the equivalent of your, of your kernel launch and any other uh, um, compute uh, language. So it's, it's actually a pretty small amount of code to actually make use of this. Um, <clears throat> so let me tell you a little bit about the challenges that we've met uh, in doing this. So one of the biggest things, uh, biggest problems that we had was in terms of bitcode versioning. So we shipped the original version of RenderScript with basically an LVM 2.7 bitcode format. And things sort of changed over the many, many release cycles for Honeycomb. And eventually, we shipped one that was on the 2.9 bitcode, which is wildly different and not supporting all of the 2.7 features. So this required us to write uh, various translation uh, layers, um, which are actually fortunately very, like, fairly simple to break out from traditional LLVM, but is something that we'd like to avoid doing in the future. Um, uh, Ice Cream Sandwich brings 3.0 bitcode, which um, fortunately, like, we only really need one translator in each direction right now. Um, hopefully, this LVM 3.0 bitcode lasts for a little while longer than, than the previous versions. Um, we've also switched from the legacy JIT path to MC code gen. Um, and this was a huge, huge difference. So now we can support uh, basically the way that we cache off scripts. We have to you know, relink things uh, and, and, and redo the, the dynamic linking. It's, it's quite a bit more, uh, more difficult. The, uh, so, so yeah, so we have translators to go in both directions. The offline compiler has a translator to generate actually old 2.7 bitcode from current modern day Clang and LLVM, which is, which is also um, supplied in the, in the open source project. We also have this metadata extraction library. And this, is, this happened because we basically realized that we were doing a lot of work to actually like pull things from the bitcode that we had supplied there for ourselves. And then we realized everybody else who wants to implement a back end for a render script is going to have to do the same exact thing. And it's a, it's a lot of work. And we didn't want people to have to essentially handle multiple versions of bitcode and, and, and all of our crazy formatting for this kind of stuff. So basically, we just said, you know what, let's just write some helper library that we can then pass along to everybody else, and we can all use it. And so Ice Cream Sandwich actually makes use of this uh, as well. The other, uh, the other challenges that we, that we encountered are, you know, basically fixing bugs that were essentially Android specific. So getting this to actually build for, for the ARM targets that we had for Honeycomb, uh, getting support for the LLVM, uh, the, basically the JIT path for ARM uh, in the Honeycomb timeframe uh, required a, a lot of effort. Um, Clang, on the other hand, was actually fairly easy. So we're actually 32 lines different from the, from the upstream version of Clang today. Um, and this is really just because we support additional vector uh, operations uh, or additional vector selectors. So Whereas you know, normally we have X, Y, Z, W, we also support RGBA, because again, graphics people love this stuff. Um, the, uh, the other thing is the support for forcing long to 64-bit. And that's actually a pretty trivial thing to do to, to keep it optional, so that that way everyone is happy. This stuff is pretty much ready to upstream. I just really have to sort of package it up and send the email. It's, it's pretty easy, and I'll probably be doing that the week after Thanksgiving. <laughs> um, as far as the external LLVM stuff, this one, we're about 368 lines different from LVM upstream. Fortunately, it's mostly in stuff that's really dead code. Um, there were a lot of legacy JIT uh, ARM fixes that we needed to do. And unfortunately, those, those pieces don't have tests. Um, so submitting an upstream uh, patch for these kinds of things, while also you know, particular, like mostly unused uh, for this code path, um, it's actually very, very uh, <laughs> dead code uh, these days, because I think most people have moved on to, to MC um, and are waiting for MC JIT to, to sort of uh, do anything for ARM JIT. So a lot of these are probably not necessarily needed to, do, to send upstream. 
I don't think there was anything that we found um, bug-wise in uh, the MC path that we didn't submit upstream and, and, and work towards a fix. Um, the other thing that causes some of the differences is that we are stripped down quite a bit uh, from the basic LLVM version. So we don't provide debugging support today. It's something that we were actively working on to put back in. But it's a, it was a huge challenge to sort of ship all these additional libraries and, and Bitcode uh, as it was in Honeycomb was already, we were basically already faced with how are we going to fit this on, on a phone, right? How are we gonna fit this on the, on the devices that we care about? So those kinds of things had been removed. Fortunately, going forward, we now have a bit more breathing room for, for what we can do. And as we add debugging support and, and debugging tools uh, for the front end stuff, we're probably going to be adding this stuff back. So again, this stuff mostly will converge back again with LLVM. So all of the, the BCC work, other than these 368 lines, is basically independent and just using the LLVM APIs the way that they were intended to be used, uh, which is fantastic. So <clears throat> one of the other, uh, so now I wanted to take a quick dive into the, the last challenging topic that we had um, with this. And this is actually the most, to me, this is the most interesting part. Uh, and hopefully it's interesting to everybody here, uh, or maybe it's, it's nothing, nothing new. Um, so one of the things that, that we needed to do was, since we're interfacing with the Java side, where things are basically, uh, you know, you have this managed language and nice garbage collection and everything else going on, you want to create an allocation, you want to pass it along to a script. And then, as I mentioned before, this is all asynchronous, right? So if you kick off a function that uses that allocation, the Java side doesn't know whether or not you're actually done with it. So it may actually go to clean up that allocation, right, when this, when this Java function ends, even though there's work still going on in the background on the, on the script side. So we didn't really, you know, there was, there was no real obvious way to, you know, sort of handle this. So we figured there has to be, you know, we can probably just reference count this very, very cheaply, but we have to make sure that these allocations don't get messed up then on the script side by the user. And we didn't want to make it difficult for people to do this either. So we didn't want people calling like crazy APIs to deal with allocations. We wanted it to look just like C, right? So that if they have a pointer and they want to, you know, access the thing that's being pointed to, they shouldn't have to go through some indirect crazy function uh, to do that. They should be able to assign the value of a pointer arbitrarily. They should be able to move pointers around. And uh, essentially, so what, what we did was we have this API for setting and clearing objects, but we don't explicitly require the user to use it. Instead, we're basically going to treat all of their stuff, um, you know, we're going to treat all of their assignments and scoping for their local variables uh, appropriately so that we can clean it up for them. And so we do this basically by a annotating the Clang AST. So rather than doing this at the LLVM layer where we sort of lost scope information and a lot of other things, um, it was easier to sort of take Clang AST, modify it in place, and then emit our bit code after doing this, uh, this transformation. So we convert assignments into set objects. We insert destructor calls for clear object for local variables. All the global variables are cleared with a, basically the equivalent of static destructor at the end of uh, script cleanup. So the way that we did this, we have a, I, have an, I have an example, which is a very, very contrived example, because we have these managed types um, called like RS font or RS allocation. Um, all of these things are, are things that are opaque to the user, but they're going to use them from, from the Java side and from the script side. And so in this example, I have a couple local variables that I want to that I want to take care of, and there's a couple global variables that those will get cleared at the very very end. Um, and there are a lot of crazy cases to obviously handle. So assignments are pretty easy. You can convert things to set object. You can also do. Um, you may have to split an initializer across multiple lines. Um, so we do automatic zero initialization of all these data types uh, because it's the safest way to sort of handle it, and we don't want to accidentally dereference something that that's not really an allocation that we were working with. Um, so yeah, so we first do a conversion to add all the, al the set objects, followed by adding clear objects. And the, the interesting part here is obviously handling you know, all of the crazy cases within um, you know, like a switch statement where a break could be scoped to the switch, it could be scoped to a loop, it could be you know, scoped to any sort of thing. And so we insert clear objects uh, in, all of those, in all of those places as well. And so this is kind of a, a neat project. This is actually the first thing I worked on um, when I started uh, working on this project because they had no, way, no real way of dealing with this short of telling the programmer, 
yeah, you have to manage the lifetime of these objects, even though you're used to using Java and, and really don't want to do memory management. So <clears throat> I guess uh, overall, like, uh, you know, RenderScript, the goal was to do this portable, high performance, you know, developer friendly language. So we, you know, picked C99 and sort of ran with it. Um, it is the 3D graphics and compute acceleration path for, for Android today. Um, and we're hiding a lot of the complexity of, of doing this um, by using, you know, LVM and Clang. Um, there's a lot of reflection. There's a lot more than what I've even shown here. So we have a lot of other helper functions that, that we are generating in the Java side for, for users. And the library is actually quite large um, for, for runtime functions that we're providing today. Uh, future work that we're, that we're looking at right now, debugging and profiling support. Uh, debugging should, should hopefully be something that we'll, we'll get there very, very soon. Um, and profiling is quite important uh, as well, particularly as, a, as we want to move off the CPU and onto other uh, compute devices. Uh, we also want to look at doing some improved uh, vector intrinsics. Um, so again, going along with the portability side of things, you know, being able to, to sort of pipe this through from the Clang side, uh, well, from the language side through Clang and LLVM, and actually then do, uh, you know, have some portable intrinsics uh, to use is something also quite uh, interesting to us so that we can accelerate a lot of the helper library functions. Um, and all this stuff is available online now. So, questions? So, okay, so this is a question about when the, when the on-device comp compilation uh, takes place, whether it's on-demand um, or is it done, you know, at, at load time for, or by, even by function. So the, um, the way that we do this today is when, this, when the script is actually loaded, uh, so when you do a, a new uh, script C for, like, in the, in the case of the example for script C mono, we would actually do the compilation of that whole unit when, uh, when the user does the new script C mono, the blue uh, section here. So we only compile the script at that time, um, and we do cache off scripts. So once, we, once we've compiled the script, I mean, because we actually have a, a lot of cases where we're using the same script multiple times within the same um, chunk of Java code, we actually will save off the, the object file and then can actually just read back the object file. So we don't actually have to do the full JIT every single time. We just have to, to reload it um, in memory. Um, we don't have support for doing just the functions that you're using. Mostly because the scripts today tend to be quite small, although we have rumors of people doing much, much larger uh, script compilations than what we, were, what we were doing. We have some large ones too, but, but uh, in general, the shipping apps are quite small for scripts because they just want to accelerate the core uh, kernel functionality. Yeah. So okay. So how do I how do how do we prevent scripts from doing unsafe things like like taking an address of, of something and, and then passing it like probably as like a global variable. Right. So so today we don't have any way to, to to stop users from doing that. Right. Much like a lot of a lot of other languages, if you're if if there's no guarantee that you're going to run on the same device each time and you want to cache off a static version like a, an address that you you know that you have and you want to pass that then to a to a function. Um, we can't stop you from basically getting like grabbing like a function pointer and then passing it to some other script. Um, that's not something that we can stop you from. Right, right, right. In JVM, yeah, they they wouldn't let you do that. But in RenderScript, you can. So you are uh, unfortunately allowed to to pass things around that way. Um, and there's not. I don't think we're going to have a way to to prevent people from doing that. So, I mean, so we work, you know, in Android, you know, we're mostly concerned with, with Android as a platform. Um, there's, 
nothing stopping anybody from basically taking the, the bit code and either reflecting more helper functions like via, you know, like uh, basically C bindings for render script um, and, and providing it as a desktop uh, replacement, you know, or desktop version of uh, graphics acceleration and compute acceleration. But I don't think that we have any specific plans, plans to do that, mostly because um, we're, again, focused primarily on mobile for, for these particular parts. And we did this more, uh, more as a way to sort of uh, start this community of getting getting people sort of involved in, in implementing a back end for compute, right, and graphics based on their stuff, right? And so we provide this base, uh, base layer and then hopefully help everybody else to get their stuff to work with that base layer, right? So we wanna partner with, with as many people as possible to sort of get them running, you know, render script uh, on their device as possible. And if someone wants to do that for the desktop, I'm sure we, you know, we could consider it, but I don't think that that project will start at, at at Android, right? Yeah. How far along is? I. Yeah. Okay. So, how far along is GPU support? So, I, I, since I don't work at, since Google doesn't work on GPU, as at, at all, um, I can't really talk about what our partners are, what our partners are doing. Um, Feel free to talk to anybody who who may be doing GPU um, backends for this, but there are you know there are things in development uh, for this. And and we are we are we will work together with with teams to do this right. So so that so the APIs that we that we shipped um, and and posted now to the open source side of things provides an actual driver abstraction layer um, for developers to actually use to implement whatever backend they want, even if it's just an optimized ARM backend. So if someone wants to replace the libbcc part, they're free to do that. Um, there's, no, there's no reason to believe that our, our code generation and, and the strategies that we chose for, you know, for honeycomb and for ice cream sandwich are the only strategies to, to choose. Um, you know, and so I think that you know, even taking what's there and sort of Tuning it for your particular device, or are, there's still some wide open space there as well. Back. Oh, okay. So, so yeah. So you're asking about like. So we have. I showed. I showed an example where we had X and Y, um, and isn't this a bit? Isn't this a bit? You know, like limited for GPU compute or you know, like compute in general. And X and Y are just the API that's supported today. So in in Honeycomb, we supported actually like X and Y because we only allow two dimensional allocations today. Future APIs actually will expand that to as many dimensions as you want. Um, and I actually did. So all of the type checking work done. Uh, on the Java side, because before Ice Cream Sandwich, there actually were only um, script side bindings for for each, so you could only do a, a grid launch from within a script, which was kind of an ugly looking recursive, uh, you know, co code like that people didn't really like the way that that looked. Like you had to create a function that then called a for each on your root function, um, and it's not really recursive, but it can sort of look that way. And it's like, why does this script have to call itself? Um, so today, right now, we only support two-dimensional allocations, but we will have n-dimensional allocations in the future. I don't know which API we're going to actually release that in, but there, the work is already done, basically, for these things. The, uh, the, other, the other part of this is that the, all of the type checking work and the dimensionality checking work that I did for Ice Cream Sandwich allows us to arbitrarily parameterize root functions however we want. So the way that the, the root functions are handled today, um, if you look at the sample code here, where there's input parameters and, and, and it takes an X and a Y, there's actually a place for users to put whatever parameters they want as well. Um, so you can hang all sorts of other parameters. You can't access those parameters from the Java side because the Java won't know how to pack up whatever, you know, essentially blob of data that you wanna, wanna pass along. But any regular data, data types that you wanna pass along uh, for the input and the output, we can actually do that. The X and the Y are supplied you know, again, via the, when the runtime actually says, you know, like a GPU would have multiple threads and they would each get assigned 
some number of these things, and you know, you get your x and y coordinate. Um, so I think that it will be more general in the future. For now, x and y is enough. Um, I know that actually I think you can even do z in ICS, but there's no way to create a z, si a z dimension allocation. But I'm pretty sure you can actually use z with these as well, um, mostly because we left the support there in the, in the compiler, but not in the Java API. Uh, okay, so I'm not, I'm not really a graphics person, so I, I actually can't really answer the, the first part of that question. As far as uh, contrasting this with OpenCL, this, I mean, again, we went with a language that everyone's familiar with. Um, I think C99 is less of, a, less of a leap for a Java programmer than OpenCL is. Um, and I believe that you know, the general purpose in general purpose computing means that you're not tuning for particular bizarre memory spaces. Um, this was sort of, again, it was started as a, as a graphics project. Uh, it wasn't actually, it, this, all this work was begun, I believe, before OpenCL had sort of, you know, come onto the scene. And the compute backend, uh, or the compute support actually came about because it was basically, hey, we have most of the, you know, we have this great new 3D graphics engine idea that sort of leverages all of the good ideas from the past 20 years of graphics and sort of does away with a bit of the cruft of OpenGL. Um, and, uh, and it's very, very close to being a compute API. What can we do to actually make this a compute API? And are there interesting problems to solve on, on mobile? And it turns out that there are interesting compute problems on mobile that, that you would want a you know, massively parallel uh, processing paradigm to, to, to throw at. You know? So I can get you in touch with graphics people to sort of give you an answer to the graphics part of the question, though, if you want. The other, the other two guys, Shiwei is another compiler person who worked on this project, and the other two guys on the, on the title slide are the graphics folks. Although they sometimes look at the compiler things too, so. Yeah? Any comments on maybe possible bindings for JavaScript? Uh, okay, so possible bindings for JavaScript. We haven't really looked at doing any additional bindings for, for, for other languages, mostly because the only way to produce um, portable apps in Android today is through Java, is through Dalvik, um, and the regular Android SDK. Should you know there be there be a need to do you know I mean I think we could do JavaScript bindings as well. I mean we could do native bindings for this. Um, it's just whether or not there's motivation to to do that. As far as native bindings, native bindings sort of defeat the purpose of having a portable, you know, runtime and, and language. Um, Right, right, right. I, I understand, but I, yeah, I think right now there's no plan to to support uh, JavaScript. But there, I mean, it's something we could look at. All right. Any other questions? Oh, one more. Okay. So the experience of using LLVM IR as a cross-platform IR. So. Um, for us, the portability problem, and, and this will come up again later today, um, we weren't looking for global portability, right? Universal portability. Universal portability is probably something that is, you know, best left to, you know, sort of to wonder about in an academic sense. Um, we had a, a set of architectures that we knew we were looking to target, and, you know, most of these architectures followed the same sort of pattern. Usually 32-bit, little endian, you know, very very explicit uh, memory models, and we said, well, if we just you know choose to hold some of these things steady, can can we actually settle on this as a, as a portable IR? And it turns out that we can. And and part of the part of the reason that RenderScript is able, like, we would be saying, let's use RenderScript IR as the portable IR for the you know for for the future, but it's not really appropriate. Um, RenderScript good, gets around a lot of the portability problems that, that uh, a portable IR for LLVM in general uh, is going to have because we control the low-level uh, C API that it's, that it's connecting to, so, so, or the native APIs that it's connecting to. So we don't provide access to the raw native shared objects on the machine. 
So in that way, we can, we can do what I, insert whatever layers we need to sort of handle any bizarre argument passing or, or whatever uh, from the lower level libraries, right? And we can compile them with the same compiler that we are using for, to do our, our portable IR. So we sort of push the portability problem lower. And, uh, you know, it's, I think, I mean, that's, that's the biggest challenge for, for doing a portable IR uh, is going to be whether you provide support with, to, act, to interface with other native libraries that are not generated by your portable IR. But we don't, we don't have to worry about that with RenderScript. All right. Thanks, everybody.